Okay, thank you very much for that. So I just wanna, my name is Elena Saev and I'm, I have the pleasure of a leading lecture series alongside with uh, Filippo Carlo Uhink and Marcia Schenk at Potsdam University as part of uh, DAD project, which is um, this lecture series is called Migration and Displacement, uh, Histories, Stories and Myths. And this is part of our explorations in Potsdam to see how we build the foundations of setting up a migration studies program. And uh, to launch our Zoom sessions, uh, it's really exciting that we can welcome uh, Nisha McSweeney and Yana Makrisova, who are gonna talk today about the myth of the ancient Greek colony. And I'm just gonna do a couple of uh, brief introductions uh, for our speakers. Um, and then we will go into a, discuss into a presentation of about 45 to 60 minutes. And then we will have about half an hour for questions. So um, I'm going to begin with uh, Nisha McSweeney, who is a professor of archaeology at the Institute of Classical Archaeology at the University of Vienna. And prior to moving into this field, she also spent time in policy research, working on conflict and international development. Her current research focuses on the construction of identity and cultural interaction with a focus on the ancient Greek world and Anatolia from the Iron Age to the classical period as part of which she's the lead academic editor for the Journal of Anatolian Studies. Among her publications is her 2018 book, Troy Myth City Icon, which was shortlisted for the 2019, um, 2019 Prose Award. And this explores the mythic archeological and cultural significance of Troy. In her keenness to communicate research more widely, she spends time in outreach activities, including being presenter on the BBC TV series, Digging for Britain in 2019. Most of her time at the moment, however, and the key reason why we have invited her and Yana today is focused on her ambitious project that will change how we understand the relationship between settlement, transformation and mobility, and will challenge any normative definitions of colonization. And for short, it's called Mi'kmaq, which is migration and the making of the ancient Greek world, which is founded by the ERC. I won't say more about this at the moment, because the talk will allow us to delve into that in some depth. But I do want to quote Nisha's um, bridging of our research histories, as well as the ancient and current world, which is what this series is really all about. And she writes, sorry, Nisha, I hope you don't mind. It is publicly available, this quote. And I just think it's really important, especially for um, our lecture series. She writes, I am also interested in wider engagement with the antiquity and the politics of reception and heritage. I passionately believe that those of us who study the past also have a responsibility to the present. And I think that is something that is often seen as a challenge and incredibly important about how we do that. And with her presenting will be Yana Markusova, who is also working on this ambitious project and who is also an archeologist and holds the position of research associate on the project, which is, and she's herself based in Cambridge University. Previously, she has been lecturer in archeology span at the universities of Sheffield and London. And while her excavation and survey projects span across Turkey, Greece, Italy, Georgia, Bulgaria, and the USA, her work specializes in Western Anatolia and the Eastern Aegean from the late Bronze Age to the classical period. And in particular, she's interested in the theoretical approaches to ancient mobility. This includes regional perspectives and issues of technological transfer, as for example, of the role of iron, which has led to the project Sideros with Dr. Marek Verchik from Prague and their joint publications on early Iron Age technology in culture history. She's also one of the co-editors with myself and a team of us in rethinking antiquity through mobility. And so we will now hear about their research in the uh, paper, The Myth of the Ancient Greek Colony, and I hand it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to all of our hosts and to all of you for showing up today. Um, we're both super happy. I think I think I Jan agrees with me. We're both yes. very, very happy to be part of this uh, lecture series, which we think is ambitious. It's exciting, and we really look forward to the rest of the lectures in the series and what what they will bring. Should we begin to be share screen right? Um, yes, I'm going to share the PowerPoint now. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen okay. And Nisha will open up. Uh, right, fantastic. Um, so we're starting today um, with the topic, the myth of the ancient 
Greek colony. And um, I gather some of you may have studied the ancient Greek world, some of you may not, but I imagine all of you have an idea or an association somewhere in the back of your head um, between the ancient Greeks on the one hand and ideas or concepts of colonialism, colonization, and especially the history of Western imperialism on the other. Um, and th this, this sense, this sense of this connection is, is what's captured particularly brilliantly um, by Marianne Maguire in the image that we've chosen for our front slide here. And I'm not going to talk about it specifically, but we're going to kind of circle back round um, to this image later on in the talk and to think about that um, and to unpack this idea. So this is what we'd like to do in the next uh, 43 or so minutes is to try um, and unpack the assumptions that we have linking colonialism and especially Western imperialism, colonialism on the one hand with the ancient Greek world on the other, and what was actually happening in the ancient Greek world when it comes to migration, mobility and settlement in various different places. Now the way we're going to try and do this is by adopting essentially the same approach which is adopted by the entire seminar series where we're going to think on the one hand about real histories and real experiences of human mobility and on the other hand we're going to kind of juxtapose this with the myths and the stories that we tell ourselves about that mobility and of course we're very interested in the disjoint that we can find between the two the disjoint between the fact and the fiction between the realities of migration and the representation of migration and we'll obviously be focusing mostly within the ancient Greek world, but we will be circling around to think of more modern things towards the end. And so because we have this kind of idea of the disjoint, we're doing one and the other, and because we have one face facing the other, and because there are two of us, we're, we're doing this as a little bit of a dialogue, a little bit of a, um, a double act. And so Jana is going to be the voice of reality, um, and I'm going to be the voice of mythology and representation. So in my voice of mythology, representation and stories, I'd like to start us out with a poem. Oh, yes. Brilliant. Thanks. Anna. And it's a poem called My Body Can House Two Hearts by the Welsh Iraqi poet Hanan Issa. We say Kalbain for two hearts, pumping parts through crimson sea, tied to lands, history split. I've tried to fit uneasily. A blazing of blood combined, obsess rewind, frustrate me. Say, between two stools I fall, these boundary walls formed early. But my body is enough, gently tough, stretching agony, growing a love, embracing, rejecting patriarchy. No need to be, shame my peers, or let my fears rat race me. Two hearts my body can hold. So I mould my legacy to make space enough for all. Standing tall, I rise, breathing free. Two hearts, a strength none can take. Love's a lake and the world is thirsty. Now, I find this poem very powerful and very poignant and uh, very thought provoking. And it strikes a very deep chord with me. Um, and Jana, when she heard it too, said exactly the same thing. And I'm sure many of you um, would, this would resonate with quite a few of you as well. It, it evokes something powerful about being it from more than one place, being from more than one nation, maybe having more than one ethnicity or identity. But although I really, really like this poem a lot, I also find it very deeply troubling. Um, the central idea of this poem is of a migrant as somebody who fundamentally has two hearts because they belong simultaneously to two places at once. And this is an idea that really, really bothers me. It rests on the assumption that most people only have one heart, that perhaps people should only have one heart. It assumes that most people normally belong only to one place. And that if you belong to more than one place, more than one culture, more than one identity, there is something deviant about that. There's something different, there's something which requires explanation. And while Hanan Issa does make this something quite glorious and she celebrates it, at the heart of it, there is this idea of trying to fit uneasily. <laughs> 
in her words. And when Jana and I were discussing this, both of us felt that we had experienced this trying to fit uneasily. And it's definitely part of the migrant experience in the modern 21st century world. But it doesn't mean it's necessarily part of the migrant experience throughout human history. Our migrant experience today is very much predicated um, on 19th century ideas of the ethnic nation state and the assumed equivalence between national and ethnic identity and the connected assumption that these identities should usually and ideally be singular. This is certainly a feature of the world that we currently live in. But but our question is, can we retroject the modern model of identities of belonging nations and places onto the past? In this paper, we are going to argue that in the ancient Greek world, the idea of a migrant experience or a migrant identity was quite different from how we would think about it today. So put simply, whereas in the modern world, like Hanan Issa, we might feel torn between two identities and places, in the ancient Greek world, migrant identities and migrant experiences did not necessarily entail having two hearts. And this is because of the fundamental nature of the ancient Greek world, uh, which you can hopefully see on the slide here, yes. Uh, so this is because of the fundamental nature of what the ancient Greek world was. Uh, this is the, the, the Greek world uh, in red uh, in the classical period, so in the fifth century BCE. In, it comprises uh, approximately 10,036 independent and autonomous communities. Many of them were organized in the form of the city-state or the ancient Greek world for that is polis, uh, plural polis. And these city-states claim to have a Greek or more accurately in their terminology, a Hellenic identity. The basis for this Hellenic identity varied depending on who you ask at what point in time, which is quite understandable. Different historical sources claim that Hellenic identity was formulated in different ways. So one of the most famous or the most famous definition of Greekness comes from Herodotus uh, and his histories. Herodotus was an ancient Greek writer who lived in the middle of the 5th century and he comes from Halicarnassus on uh, the western coast of Anatolia, modern day Turkey. So here in this quote, as you can see, uh, which is positioned uh, within kind of the aftermath and uh, the, the Greco-Persian Wars, he names uh, several elements that he holds in common for the Greeks. And that is being of the same blood, uh, so, so common ancestry, uh, same speech, so common language, and the shrines of the god and sacrifices. Uh, so, so common ritual and cult practices and being of the same custom, so common ways of life. The various different elements of this definition and more are, are more or less important at different moments in time. But in general, we can broadly say that Greekness is built both on shared culture and ideas of shared ancestry. So if we group uh, a people such as the ancient Greeks who share an identity on common customs and the uh, of common ancestry, and if this group of people are geographically dispersed over this really broad area, so from Spain to Cyprus, from Libya to Crimea, then migration and human mobility clearly must have played a role in the formation of the ancient Greek world. But the question remains, what was the nature of this migration and mobility? Our argument here is that there is a disjoint, as already Nisha said, between the realities of these human movements and the way that these realities might have been mythologized as colonization. But first, since we are the first archaeologists in the series and we're really looking both at the actual movements as well as, as kind of the mythologization, I wanted to talk a little bit more explicitly about how we trace movement in the past. So the material record is a palimpsest, um, an outcome of past action, some of which may leave material traces and some of which may not. Our material was often discarded and reused rather than left in the place for posterity. It was then further altered by what we called post depositional processes, the processes that happen after these buildings, sites, uh, houses, and so on are abandoned. And these post depositional processes are different types of environmental or anthropogenic uh, disturbances, and our retrieval methods also uh, bear on uh, what kind of information we get. 
So this makes it a challenging fun, uh, difficult but not impossible to distinguish between the different forms of fast interaction, such as trade and exchange, and the different forms of ancient movements, uh, be it migration, mobility, or what we usually call the Greek colonization. It's not possible for us to survey, even very briefly, the mobilities that led to the formation of the entire Greek world. So we will focus on just two regions, both in ancient Anatolia, uh, modern day Turkey, uh, Ionia in red um, on the western coast and Cilicia um, in blue on the southern coast. And chronologically, our focus will be on the late second uh, and the first half of the first millennium BCE. So the periods include the late Bronze Age and the Iron Ages going into what we call the archaic and classical periods. So let me start with Ionia. Ionia is a coastal region in central western Turkey. It consists of small flat plains along the coast, immediately chased by hills and mountains. The three large river valleys that you see here as of the Meander, Kaistras, and the Hermos facilitated movement between the coast and the inland in east-west direction. This region is characterized by a long-standing pattern of engagement between Aegean, uh, so, so the Aegean Sea, which now belongs to modern-day Greece, and Anatolian communities. In the late Bronze Age, here smaller polities in this area banded together um, in a loose alliance that interacted with the Hittites, so, so the big empire centralized state in central Anatolia, and the Mycenaeans, uh, who were located in, um, in, in what is now uh, Greece. Key cities include Ephesus, Miletus, Liman, Tepe, Klazomenai, and these consumed material culture that was local. But they were also receptive to things brought from the West. The vessels took off already um, in the 14th century of the late Bronze. The mixed deposits at these sites in the coastal region, uh, in the coastal region, contrast somewhat with the continuity of predominantly local architecture, with the exception of the elite chamber tombs, which you can see on the right, uh, which are more common in the Aegean. So this has often been explained in terms of various in various processes or waves, uh, such as the result of Mycenaean colonization or migration. Uh, processes of acculturation and hybridization, which was in this context term very specifically the Mycenaeanization. So, so these areas were kind of becoming in the early RNA. Uh, so now they're producing pottery that we call protogeometric, which is characteristic of the early Iron Age and is also produced on the Greek mainland alongside local different types of undecorated ceramics, such as the gray wares that you see on the site. So this local and important protogeometric ceramics co-occurs in these settlements, and this phenomenon has traditionally been explained, surprise, surprise, by Greek immigration. But can we suggest different processes at hand, such as increased mobility of artisans and entrepreneurial merchants taking advantage of political power vacuum and stronger regional ties facilitated by maritime movement? For instance, the deposits at uh, major shrines, such as the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, at the Sanctuary of Apollo at Claros, um, at the site of Klazomenai and Smyrna, all date to the very beginning of this period. And very often we have both the late Bronze Age and the early Iron Age ceramics mixed together. Furthermore, at the site of Klazomenai, uh, pictured here on the right, there is an early to middle proto-geometric, so a very early, early Iron Age kiln, and the form of which is reminiscent of late Bronze Age examples. So, so clearly there is a suggested continuity that people who live here uh, in the early Iron Age are maintaining these technologies that were known to people who lived here in the late Bronze Age. In the course of the next 300 years, Greek style material culture gained predominance in Ionia, although with a twist. Ionia developed its own regional schools of vase painting, uh, it interacted not only with the Aegean, but also with its Anatolian neighbors, such as the Lydians and the Carians. And this is, for example, tangible in the presence of tumuli, so mounded uh, boreals or, or just mounds. Uh, there are landscape markers in this area, 
Uh, and also, this is very similar to what's happening in, in the further areas to the east, so the inland areas of Lydia and Phrygia. Continuity of linguistically mixed populations is also perceptible, such as in the works of Hipponax, a 7th century poet who lived at Ephesus and Clazomenae, and who integrated Lydian words and knowledge of the Lydian language, um, and also of Lydia as an area in his rather rude creations. Moreover, sculptural work also attests style that might have been influenced by non-Greek sculptures, such as the family group of Genelaos, which you can see here, who was a Samian nobleman. Or not pictured here, um, a famous statue of Hera, um, cult statue Hera of Heramias. And, and Heramias as a name, for instance, is not Greek, but also it was dedicated um, on Samos, so an Ionian island. So this is quite interesting because this is also the time when being Greek, rather than being related to the Carians and the Lydians, so the other Anatolian cultural groups, becomes important. Now let's move quickly to Cilicia. Cilicia or Kilikia, sometimes it's pronounced this way too, is a large region in southern Anatolia. It consists of two parts, the Cilician plain or the and mountainous rough Cilicia, and I will be interested on the area of here on the map. This area was a part of the kingdom of Tarhuntasha and Kizuwatna. These were vassal territories again to the Hittite Empire, and its inhabitants used to speak uh, with Indo-European Luvian language. They maintain contacts with other regions, including Cyprus, as well as already, already mentioned Hittites, which you can see here on the right. And on the left, you can see uh, a large building from the later stage of the Late Bronze Age from Kilise Tepe, one of the central sites in the area and the region we're interested in. After the collapse of the Hittite Empire, the area experienced increased localization and fragmentation into smaller territorial polities, namely the Hilaku and then the Ke, as well as uh, uh, they consisted of part of southern Phrygia. And this is also seen in the middle to late Bronze Iron Age archaeological record. Local kings seem to have competed and collaborated with each other by turns, maintaining a broad network of trade and communication. Uh, that stretched north and westwards into central Anatolia, as well as out onto the maritime world of the Eastern Mediterranean. So with the connections to Cyprus, to the Phoenician cities of the Levant and the Neo-Assyrians of Mesopotamia. So in addition to this really rough understanding of political developments in this area, we do have evidence for linguistic and cultural diversity following um, kind of the, the middle uh, Iron Age, so the 10th and the 9th centuries BCE. Examples include Luvian, so the, the, the native Anatolian language, hieroglyphic reliefs at Ibris uh, of King Warpalawas, which you can see here on the left, uh, also at other uh, rocks such as Kizilda, Karada, and Turkmen Karahuyuk, which belong to King Hartapu, as well as Luvian Phoenician bilingual inscriptions from Karatepe and Chinikoi here on the slide on the right and a further Phoenician inscription from Laertes. Akkadian is also attested alongside Phoenicians at Injerli and Tarsus. So this suggests that there were people in this region who understood and could interact with many languages and also with very specific imagery of power. But what about the movement of actual people? An important conduit of local mobility was the Kalikatnos, uh, or the modern Guxu River Valley, which flourished in the Iron Ages. So the principal site here was um, Kilisa Tepe, which I already mentioned, with its large-scale storage facilities, a defensive wall, and local and super-regional objects. It facilitated the flow of resources between the coast and Cyprus and inland Anatolia, as you can see here on the map. In the north of Kilisa Tepe, uh, the Karaman Plain was a major, uh, major kind of late Bronze Age uh, settlement region. And these sites here were still inhabited during the Middle and Late Iron Ages. So here on the map, uh, kind of it's, uh, it's just north of, of Gormut Tepe. Uh, so, so the plain is around Kiselda, Asusan, Huyuk. Uh, 
the valley, on the other hand, experienced a decrease in settlement numbers. Um, so that's the valley from Bermud Tepe down to Keben and in green, but Kilisa Tepe continued to exist. Early Iron Age material culture in the valley is relatively rare, although this might have to do with our inability to date non-decorated local ceramics rather than a real pattern. The general pattern consists of a small number of mandinucleated settlements located on prime agricultural land close to the river intersections, but about a floodplain. The valley also and the plain experienced a shift in settlement patterns at the end of the Middle Iron Age, so, so around the, the late 9th and the 8th centuries BCE, as documented by the Lower Goksu Archaeological Project, which was co-directed by Nisha, and the Tashali Karaman Archaeological Project, which is directed by our colleague Emre Sherifolu. After the middle, a late Iron Age uh, in the plain, the populated inland regions seem to have completely emptied in the 7th century BCE. So here on the map, you can really count the number of the known sites occupied inland after this period on, well, one finger, uh, the site of Maidanjikala. As you can see, the valley and the plain are completely empty. Even at Kilisa Tepe, these periods are only sparsely attested by a very small number of chance sites, and there is no evidence for settlement or occupational level, so really no evidence for architecture. This shift can be partially attributed to the military activities of the Assyrians, so the famous king Sargon II and Sennacherib, against the local kingdoms as well as the neighboring Phrygians. Uh, and, and of course, this would inevitably have brought uh, political instability as well as destabilization of the important trade routes and disruption of economic patterns. Yet this does not really explain why the pattern did not reassert itself later once the stability has evened out. Instead, we must think also about alternative networks and trade routes that were opening up at this time. New patterns and directions of mobility that suddenly began to um, seem more appealing or more viable than the old ones. In contrast to the old patterns of mobility that led primarily inland, the new pattern focuses on maritime networks. This is precisely at a time in the 7th century that local coastal settlements such as Laertes, Nagidos, Soli, and Calendarists, so on this map in black, start to appear. These settlements tend to display evidence for a wide set of maritime connections, including Cyprus, the Levant, and the Aegean. Uh, so, so the Aegean, I mean, with the Greek world. At the same time, much of the ceramic material from these new settlements conforms to the familiar types and styles previously used inland in Cilicia, suggesting that in addition to these new communities, uh, they were also forged brightly through inter-regional maritime mobilities. Uh, there are also these new intra-regional mobilities of people moving from inland settlement to the coastal areas. Over the course of the 5th and the 4th centuries, uh, we see a conspicuous shift in the networks of connection at these settlements. There is an increased consumption of Greek-looking objects and an increased engagement with Greek cultural forms and cultural practices. These include adoption of Greek modes of funerary commemoration, Greek weight standards in coinage, as depicted here, and the practice of carving civet inscriptions in stone. During this period, several communities in this area began to make explicit claims to a Greek civic identity, which means that they started labeling themselves as city-states, as the police. So we have seen that the patterns of movements in both Cilicia and Ionia uh, led to the establishment of settlements, which later became Greek. And these patterns were complex, nuanced, and shifting. There was no single or singular movement uh, that created these communities. Instead, there was an ongoing kind of what in English we call Brownian motion. Uh, so kind of people and, and objects moving back and forth in an unpredicted uh, pattern, which was punctuated irregularly by specific events or trends. This in itself is not a new observation. But what needs to be emphasized is that we can demonstrate the longevity and complexity of these connections, caused in no small part by the movement of people at smaller scales than the models of migration and recolonization would allow. Okay, great. So we're 
if we've had this picture then um, of the real mobilities that go into the formation of communities in both Cilicia and Ionia, and we can see that it's a very complex, it's a changing, it's a shifting picture, the next question then is, how are these complex and nuanced mobilities, how are they represented? How are they mythologized? Now we've already said, Jan has already explained, <coughs> excuse me, that the evidence that we have for the real mobilities is itself um, partial, the archaeological record is imperfect, it requires a lot of interpretation. But for our evidence for the mythologization of those mobilities is also partial, it's also imperfect, um, and it also requires rep uh, um, interpretation. Um, it comes mostly in the form of literary texts written by and for, to a large extent, by and for an educated, mostly male elite. Um, some of our evidence for this mythologization comes from broader based sources, so um, things which might be dis um, displayed on coinage or decorated ceramics, as we have here, um, things um, imagery on sarcophagi and other artifacts, um, and also perhaps inscriptions set up by local authorities or wealthy individuals. But all of this evidence, just to remind you, is not evidence for actual migration. That's what Jana has given you. Um, the evidence, the archaeological we have evidence we have for the migration that formed these communities. The evidence that I'm going to be talking about is later evidence for what people thought about these migrations, evidence for how people recounted, retold and imagined these migrations in later generations at a later point in time. Now, what I hope I've just stressed is that what I'm going to talk about is not even what everybody thought about those migrations and mobilities. We have very little evidence for what the regular person in the street might have thought. Um, there's no equivalent of uh, tabloid newspapers to read or private diaries. Our evidence is mostly in the forms of either official versions of history as promoted by civic authorities, with perhaps a slight, a, a few glimpses of alternative stories and traditions coming through. Nevertheless, it's enough to give us a rough idea of how the ancient Greeks understood and represented the complex mobilities that Jana have, has just been describing to you. So in looking at this, um, the first thing I did was to start off looking at the evidence for the mythologization of Ionian mobilities. So what we have over the course of about a millennium and a half, so texts which stretch from the 8th century BCE to the 12th century CE, we know of 115 different authors who wrote in the languages of Latin and ancient Greek, um, and between them they wrote 486 different passages of text which discuss the origins of the Ionian cities. Um, can you all see the, 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 yes, brilliant, that's the slide, great. Um, some of the passages appear in works that we would now class as narrative history writing, historiography, but in other passages of text appear in poetries, plays, and even in technical treaties. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the way that these diverse texts from diverse time periods, the way that they all represent the mobilities is itself quite diverse. Now on this slide, you have um, just a brief table which shows you the four main groups of stories which are identifiable in this assemblage of texts. There are stories which talk about um, what's called as the Ionian migration, which is a label that we have uh, largely invented in modern times to describe um, the Greek colonization of Ionia from mainland Greece with large groups of people moving from Western, uh, kind of the, the mainland of Greece or the Western side of the Aegean and settling in Anatolia. This is known as the Ionian migration. And we have a certain group of authors who mention the Ionian migration, who talk about um, the foundation of Ionia as being uh, formed through the Ionian migration. We also have a second group of authors who talk about the formulation, the creation of these cities, not through migration, um, from specifically Athens and, and the Western Aegean, but more generally from other various places around different parts of the Aegean. 
Um, and you've got just an example on the right hand side of your screen here, um, an example of a, a migration being described from the island of Crete. And this is a significant group of authors as well who, do, who, who contribute to this story group. The third story group that we have is a set of authors who write instead about the origins of these cities, of the Ionian cities, as coming from um, either the migration or the lack of migration of indigenous autochthonous people, people who have always occupied the land, usually described as carrions in our sources, and they are the ones who are responsible for the founding of these cities according to and here's just another example on the right hand side of the slide a slightly smaller group of sources but a distinct category nonetheless is the group of sources which talk about these cities as founded from my, founded by migrants traveling from the ancient near east mostly although not exclusively from phoenicia and you just have an example of that on your right hand slide and then of course you'll i'm sure have noticed the last line in this uh, table, which highlights that several of our authors, 52 out of 115, actually offered more than one story, more than one account for how these cities were created. This gives us a sense that we don't have one single simple narrative within the ancient Greek sources themselves for the origins of these cities. The way that the ancient Greek sources are mythologizing the mobilities is in itself quite complex, quite variable. It's also quite changeable over different points in time. And um, I have a slide which is presumably coming up in a minute. I think my, my laptop is a little bit slow, so I might be behind everybody, um, which shows you the relative popularity of different stories in different periods over the long time span that we tend to uh, categorize within classical antiquity. And within only two of these, centuries, that's the third century BCE and the second century CE, can we see there is a clear preference for stories of what we might now recognize as Greek colonization. At other points in within antiquity, the ancient Greek sources themselves mythologize the migrations quite differently. There are only two specific moments in time when they mythologized it primarily um, in terms of what we might think of as a Greek colonization. And I'm very happy to talk about this later on in the questions if you like, why at these particular moments in time. But the important thing here, it's just important to capture that the ancient Greek sources themselves have a very shifting, changing and diverse way of mythologizing those early migrations. We're going to move now to Cilicia and talk about the evidence we have for the mythologization of Cilician movements. Now, as you can see from the uh, slide here, it's the evidence is a lot sparser. We have simply a total of 15 authors, so that's 100 less than we have by Ionia, and they wrote no more than 17 passages of texts which make reference to how mobility contributed to the making of the Cilician cities. And because they're all there's so few of them, I've just put them onto one slide. I think the number is far too small to think of in any uh, statistical way, but I think you get a, a basic idea of the picture here. We have some uh, stories of heroic migrations from the Aegean, especially under the legendary prophet Mopsos as being responsible uh, for the foundation of the cities. We have a few other stories of founders coming from other places, other parts of the Aegean, but also um, from Phoenicia too. And we have a few more vague, uh, perhaps what could be indigenous um, people who are said to have uh, be founders as well. So looking at the Cilician evidence made me go back to rethink the Ionian evidence actually. Is there something which is perhaps wrong about the way I was approaching the Ionian evidence, which has been highlighted by looking at this Cilician evidence. And what I realized when I started to do this is that when I started with the Ionian evidence, the categories that I developed in my head was according to where the migrants in the stories were supposed to have come from. I created one category of kind of Greeks from Peninsula Greece, and I created another category for, for migrants from um, the rest of the Aegean, and I created a third category from Near Eastern migrants. But what if this is not the most important axis of difference? What if there is 
a more a more significant difference in perhaps the form and the function of these different story groups. So what I then proceeded to do is adopt perhaps a more archaeological perspective, um, undertaking undertaking what we would we would think of as contextual analysis, thinking about the different contexts in which these stories are told um, and the other passages of text around them. And what we see there is that actually there is a different way available of thinking or clustering or categorizing these different mythologies of migration. The first of these is actually a group of stories which talk about the foundation of cities as being attributed to traveling heroes or heroic wanderers. And this is something that we've got just two passages of text that we've seen before, which are examples um, from for the city of Miletus in Ionia again. Um, but this is a type of text, a type of story that we see, which tends to be associated with larger, more important cities, precisely like my Ion uh, Miletus in Ionia. Associating these with a traveling hero is something that seems to happen in the context of claims of power, claims of hegemony, especially over your neighbors. It's the kind of claim that a city tends to make about itself, sometimes to an internal audience, but more often than not, it tends to be making this kind of claim to a wider regional audience in the context of regional uh, political uh, di um, and diplomacy, di dip diplomatic negotiations or regional interactions. So that's the first category of the type of stories we're actually seeing. The second category, the second type of mythologization of mobility we get is not based around the migration of individual heroes, but about the movement of large groups, mass migration. And actually looking at these, that we tend to find these kinds of claims being made for smaller cities, for less famous cities, less powerful cities. And we also tend to find these claims related to whole regions as well. Another one of the key contextual things we've discovered is that these claims tend to appear more often than not in the context of what we call kinship diplomacy, a kind of interpolitical uh, negotiation where one city is trying to claim alliance or is trying to claim some kind of benefit um, by claiming a historical re relate relationship with another city. So these kinds of claims tend to be anonymous, they tend to involve large groups of people um, in terms of mythological movements, and it tends to be made when you're trying to make a connection between two cities who are quite geographically far away from each other. So that's the second category. The third and final category of mythologization um, that we find is not mobility at all, but is actually immobilization of autonomy of indigeneity. And I think it's very important to consider this alongside the stories and the myths that we tell of migration. We also mythologize um, not the lack of migration as well. And these kinds of claims appear, their context often seems to be um, in the context of internal dialogues and internal discourses. The audience for these kinds of myths tends to be a specifically local audience um, aimed at perhaps bolstering the way people think about themselves or how a community feels rooted in the landscape. So throughout all these categories, then, the geographic or the ethnic or the racial origin of the people involved is actually not the key factor. That's actually not the most important thing. What's much more important within the Greek mythologization of mobility is the mode and the manner of, of travel or the lack of travel. Um, as it could be. The different types of mobility or immobility create different types of settlement. And it, this is the thing which is most important in a Greek context, rather than the identities of the people who are doing the moving or not doing the moving. Now, in a way, from a modern perspective, um, categorizing uh, mythologizations according to the mode of movement is perhaps quite obvious. Um, there is, of course, a world of difference between a highly paid and highly skilled migrant who is moving 
their geographic location in order to take up a lucrative new job offer, perhaps on the one hand, there's a huge difference between that and the experience of a refugee fleeing from war on the other hand. So of course, the mode and the nature of mobility has got to be important in the way you're going to eventually end up mythologizing that mobility. But yet in our modern world, the identity of the mobile people is obviously very important as well. And I think we've experienced this quite recently when we've surveyed the different types of language used in popular media and in the press, uh, describing the refugee movements um, from Ukraine very recently and comparing that to the language which was used of the refugee movements from Syria just a few years ago. There's a very different language used in much mainstream media for these two types of similar types of movements. And I think that we can probably quite fairly say that in the modern world, we are much more concerned with the idea of geographic or ethnic or racial origin than the ancient Greek sources were. In the ancient Greek sources, that sense of origin is much less important than the mode of the movement. And this is very clear when we start to look at the modern scholarship of these ancient Greek movements. These modern treatments essentially abandon what is the Greek schema, the, the schema that we've just identified, and they instead privilege the modern schema, which really focuses on the supposed identities of um, and the geographic origins of the migrants, um, and specifically on the Greekness of the migrants. Now, what this does is it presupposes the prior existence of Greek identity, and it makes the Greek rather than the migration really the unit of analysis. It's a privileging of um, the ethnicity, which really stems from that 19th century assumption of the primacy of the modern nation state, which I mentioned earlier. It comes out of a fundamentally modern way of looking at the world, rooted in the idea of identities as being essential and being fundamental. So this is why we, as modern scholars, have adopted a very ethnic focus, and that is why we have tended to privilege discourses of Greek colonization. But why colonization in particular? And I think this is because the very specific emotional and cultural value that is placed, especially within uh, Western discourse on the ancient Greek world, linking it to notions of Western civilization, where we have a desire to see the modern West being reflected in the mirror of ancient Greek antiquity. And I think at this point we can have a look at that wonderful slide by Marion Maguire there, which juxtaposes, sorry, juxtaposes, which puts the face of um, uh, the ancient Greek face in response to um, a modern or a more modern um, colonized person. Around the time that modern scholarship was beginning to address the questions of ancient Greek mobility, it was the late 19th century, it was the early 20th century, and it was a context within which modern Western colonization was a, the dominant mode of thinking about um, movements. And this is why we have, this gives us uh, quotes like the one that you see on your screen, which tends to draw a line, a kind of genealogical line um, between what we want to see in the ancient Greek world and how we have constructed the modern world. The idea then of the ancient Greek colony, very prevalent in modern scholarship, is a myth. It is, that's why we, we gave the way uh, the conclusion in the title, I'm afraid, to this talk. It is a myth. But it is not an ancient myth, and this is our argument, it is a modern myth forged primarily in modern scholarship. And if we go back to the ancient myths, it is not a myth that we find there. And we shouldn't forget that our modern terminologies, our modern scholarship, are actually forms of mythology in and of themselves. And it is us then who has created uh, certain myths like the myth of the Greek colony. The myth of the Greek colony is in fact so strong that it is absolutely adhered to quite uh, passionately today by several scholars, even despite the weight of the evidence, especially the archaeological evidence that Jana has been showing you. So we have been doing this work as part of the larger um, ERC funded consolidated project directed by Nisha, the migration and the making of the ancient Greek world. 
Uh, the project is running between 2020 and 2025, and it is hosted by the University of Vienna. At MIGMAC, we've been thinking quite a bit about the different aspects of engine mobilities, but also the way we interpret evidence. Um, you know, also not only the, the way Nisha talked about it, but also our own biases and interpretation. Uh, so as a methodological exercise, our research groups had to examine more explicitly the link between uh, identity, sense of belonging to family histories and movement. And we did so by taking uh, a DNA test by ancestry DNA. Uh, you know, what is a better way to, to, to start uh, looking at these issues than, than actually have, a, a, you know, a data set to, to compare and contrast against. But before we received our results, we each, uh, we each had to uh, fill a really quick questionnaire and provide answers to a number of questions that we're thinking about in, in terms of both ancient and modern evidence. The first one was family history of movement and permanence. So we asked the participants to list all the relocations that they were aware of. This informed on scale, so how many of their ancestors and relatives moved, if whether they moved, has that changed over time, frequency, duration of the family mobility, as well as certainty of what people thought they knew. The next one was uh, the type of environment that people uh, grew up with, be it monocultural or multicultural. And the third one was the different types of identities that people associate with. So do they align uh, what they had at birth and, and, and now in, in later stages of life? You know, do they um, kind of do the national and ethnic identities and other kind of identities align? So after receiving these results, we asked the participants to reflect on them. Did they align with what they thought about their family origins and family histories? We asked them to pick also a handful of objects. As archaeologists, we like to think with objects and, and how we use things. So we asked these participants to, to you know, go through their kitchens, pick a handful of non-perishable objects, uh, and describe whether these could articulate their ethnic, cultural, and other types of identities. The idea was to create a situation comparable to our ancient Greek evidence. Um, so the things that, you know, that, that persist through time. So it's, it's not your food, it's not your tea, it's not your coffee, but it's the containers um, and utensils that you use. And we wanted to contrast these with the histories and identities and also our DNA results. So we are a mixed international team, and it is understandable that our results were really diverse as a, as a result of, of just the composition of our research group. And Nisha will later describe some ways in which we thought about our family histories. But I would like to focus on the later exercise, the, the kitchen utensils, the objects, which are at the core of what we archaeologists work with. So our conversation really revealed a surprising degree to which objects we use transcend their original use and cultural boundaries. Uh, and here are the different uses of certain items in our kitchens. One thing is certain, in our globalized, connected and cosmopolitan lifestyles, the objects we have in our kitchens do not really reflect our origins. Rather, they are an indication of enculturation in course of our lifetime and our personal preferences, rather than our ethnic identities. Many of us, interestingly, filled our kitchen with practical souvenirs from our travels abroad, or they adhere just to international staples. Ultimately, it seems that what matters is not what we consume or where these items are coming from, but the complex association between what and how we consume. So, so what are these items? What are they next to? What is missing? How do we use them? For example, as you can see here on the slide, everybody seems to own uh, reusable containers, bottles for olive oil, uh, or, or even, you know, wine or any similar beverages to that. But your containers for olive oil or, or your wine glasses or decanters and other treatments come in different shapes and sizes and they're used in different ways. They're also stored in different ways, as you can see here. And these can be indicative of deep-seated familial and cultural preferences. But on the other hand, they can also be uh, reflective of our more recent lived experiences. So you can, you know, here compare and contrast with different nationalities living in different places, using their olive oil and other things differently. 
So while well informative, this exercise in no small part reflects a very niche situation. Our contemporary lifestyles of predominantly Western globalized mobile people who spend a lot of time abroad because of our occupation. So most of us are archeologists. It is not directly translatable to what we study in the ancient world. Even when we compare to others in Europe and North America, we could also find vast differences in the terms of our ability to travel, make connection overseas and so on. Up to you, Nisha, now. Great. So then what about the mythologization of our movement? There's just a map here on your screen which shows you some of the stories that uh, were present in our various family histories about places that we thought we had come from or moved to or our families had come from or moved to. And not all of these showed up, of course, in our DNA results. And actually very few of them were visible in the um, archeological exercise of looking inside our kitchen cupboards. Nonetheless, we did have a number of patterns which came out of our own modern mythologies. Now there are two patterns which really talk um, which explain a lot about ourselves um, and the kind of historical uh, movements that, that we think we, we've made. Um, and that's our, first of all, um, due to glo globalization, um, we in our generation have tended to move around perhaps much more often, much more than people within our parents and grandparents' generation. But we decided this is probably partly connected to our professions, um, especially as, as archaeologists and as academics. And these movements have often been within our adult lives um, rather than childhood. Now, the other point was that few of us, none of us had very simple answers to the questions on the questionnaire about identity. Often national identity did not always fit with ethnic identity or even racial identities. Some of us were not comfortable with all of these terms, and some of us were not comfortable in making clear distinctions between these terms. And we think this is perhaps tell, um, indicative of the present moment, um, something that tells us a lot about our current day. Um, beyond that, um, there are two patterns that we identified in these modern mythologies, which we think might be more helpful when looking back at our ancient material. And these two patterns were, first of all, that long distance migrations tended to be mythologized and commemorated in family histories much more than shorter motions or mobilities or within country mobilities. Um, this might seem logical to us, but it does have important uh, implications if we're going to project this back onto the ancient world. Stories of immobility or stories of local movements are much less likely to be preserved than stories of long-term movements when we look at mythological traditions. And the second um, conclusion that we had was that we, at least in our family histories, tended to mythologize movements in, ten, in terms of the movement of individual actors. So even when uh, a grandparent or a parent moved as part of a wider mass trend, when they were perhaps prisoners of war, for example, or perhaps they migrated due to famines, the way that these stories are handed down are they're not handed down as um, participation in mass movements, they're handed down as stories of individual heroic mobility. And again, this might seem intuitive, given that we're talking about family histories, but once more, we, we think this has implications for how we think about the process of mythologization of mobility in antiquity. So we really enjoyed this exercise. It was one that helped us to think critically, not just about our origins, um, but also about the more conceptual relationships between DNA on the one hand and perhaps um, ethnicity and origins and culture and nation on the other. And the discussions that we had as a group made it very obvious just how uh, flexible, how situational and how changing most of these different identities were. And how the way that we think about them and the way we mythologize them can actually be quite different to the, to, to the real evidence uh, for real mobilities. So what have we learned? Uh, we have concluded, perhaps not coming as a surprise to anyone in this seminar, is that there is often a difference between the realities and the lived experience of migration on the one hand and the representation, the description and recounting of that migratory experience on the other. We have described this process as the mythologization of migration. 
we have thought reflexively about how we have experienced and taken part in this process ourselves, both as people on the move and people mythologizing these movements. None of this is surprising. One thing that is more surprising is the difference between the ways that we mythologize migration now and the ways the ancient Greeks mythologized it. Our tendency is to privilege the place of origins, to think about uh, where we come from, diasporas, identities, as linked to homelands, whether imagined or real, as we have projected this way of thinking back onto antiquity. We have mythologized Greek migrations through our own lens. But the Greeks went about the mythologization process differently. Their tendency was to privilege the mode of travel, as Nisha explained, and not to think of identities as linked to diasporas and homeland, but rather as linked to the process of the journey and the circumstances of the arrival. To us, it is encouraging that not everyone in history thought so as we do today. So with that thought, we thank you for your attention. We look forward to the discussion and your questions.